I'm Raymond Goldstein. I'm the Schlumberger Professor of Complex Physical Systems here at the University of Cambridge. So you're working with little green algae called Volvocales. Why are those organisms interesting and why are they interesting for a mathematician? So the Volvocales is a group of green algae that spans from a single cell organism called Chlamydomonas, which is about a tenth of a hair in diameter, uh, to organisms that have many, many cells, tens of thousands, and can be several millimeters across. And biologists have recognized since the late 1890s that uh, these organisms, because they exist now and we don't have to look in the fossil record, are very interesting to study the evolution of multicellularity, essentially trying to ask and answer the question of why is it that single cell organisms evolve to become larger and more complex. So they have a very clear place in biology for that reason. They're also very interesting because uh, they are photosynthetic and they have cilia, they have uh, hair-like appendages that allow them to swim. And these cilia, or flagella, as they're called when they're on the organism, are very much like the cilia in our lungs. So there's a physiological reason as well. But from the point of view of physics and mathematics, they have a beautiful high degree of symmetry. Uh, they have a fascinating means of locomotion. And so they're actually models to study many problems in biological physics and fluid mechanics. So all, put all together, they're multi-purpose organisms that make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you have been um, looking at and that you're interested in is how those volvocales synchronize those little flagella when they're beating. Um, could you explain more? Sure. So again, flagella, as they're called when they're on the organism, are essentially like cilia, which are found everywhere throughout the human body and most vertebrates. And wherever you find those hair-like appendages, uh, such as in our respiratory system, they're constantly pushing fluid around. And they exist in very large numbers, kind of carpets of cilia. And wherever you look, they're highly organized into either uniform kind of rower-like beating or things called metachronal waves, where there's a slight shift of the beat position from one to the next, so it looks like a Mexican wave in a stadium. And there has been for several decades uh, a hypothesis that the uh, synchrony that is observed experimentally is a consequence of fluid mechanical interactions between the flagella. And we were interested in testing this and trying to answer this question of whether this really was the mechanism. So we set out about 10 or 12 years ago to investigate this both experimentally and theoretically to understand this very crucial feature. And what did you find? <laughs> what we found was a series of uh, discoveries over that period of time that has led us now to a, a fairly complete picture of what's going on. So the first thing to say is that um, rather than trying to study a piece of our trachea or something like that, um, these organisms are very easy to grow in the lab. They are very simple uh, organisms. And if you look at uh, Chlamydomonas, for instance, which I have a little model of here, one of my postdocs made for me. So it's got a spherical body that's about 10 microns in diameter, so that's about a tenth of a human hair in diameter. And it has these two flagella that are uh, oppositely oriented like this, and it beats in a breaststroke. And um, there is uh, uh, anchoring of the flagella in the cell body, and there are filamentary connections across that are known to play an important role. And the very first discovery we made is that as these organisms beat their flagella, the beating is noisy. Uh, it has a certain amount of fluctuation to both flagella. And this noise or fluctuation is not a consequence of it just being bombarded by water molecules. It's actually internal biochemical noise associated with the proteins all along the filament that give rise to the motion. And that noise is very interesting because its presence allows us to study the mechanism of synchrony using a technique in statistical physics. So the first thing we established uh, in a, an important paper, I think, uh, about 10 years ago was basically that um, the interaction between the two flagella was of a magnitude that was consistent with the idea that it was fluid mechanical coupling. And we studied that in, in great detail uh, and then began to look at certain mutants certain organisms that have a deficiency of one sort or another. And one of them is a, a mutant in which the uh, internal biochemical connections or filamentary connections between the bases of the flagella are absent. And then it turns out almost 100% uh, of the time that there's no synchrony at all observed between the two flagella. And the only cases in which there is is when they're very, very close together. And that led us to think that actually it's not quite as simple as just fluid mechanical coupling, that probably there are elastic filaments playing a role in the coupling. So the next experiment we did was to basically have two cells, one of which has one flagellum, let's say the right flagellum, and the other has just the left flagellum. 
And then if we bring them further and closer together, we can study whether they asynchronize, but we know there's no connection between them other than the fluid. And there we established that indeed the fluid mechanical coupling was sufficient to make synchrony happen. And it happened quantitatively exactly as we would expect from theory. So that shows that it's sufficient, but it doesn't mean it's necessary. And so after that, we studied a range of more complex organisms, some of which have four or eight or even 16 uh, flagella. And there they have extremely elaborate patterns of beating, which are pretty much inconsistent with a hydrodynamic coupling mechanism, except when the number is so large that they're all close together and again strongly coupled. So the picture that we finally have is that yes, fluid mechanical interactions can synchronize flagella. They play a role, but the internal elastic connections which actually the biologists knew about for a long time, play an equally important role, and it's a combination of these two things. So you actually have um, cells that have three legs or flagella. Some or of the four, mutants have three or four, and they, yes. And the four-legged or flagellal <laughs> ones, mm -hmm. they actually do a, a trot and a canter and a gallop, yes. as you would see in a horse. That's right. In fact, uh, one of the really striking discoveries made by uh, one of my students was that um, if, you, if you look at, say, the, the four-flagellated one, it, the flagella are arranged two like this and two perpendicular. And the patterns of beats uh, are one-to-one -one correspondence to terrestrial quadrupeds like horses. You can have different kinds of gallops and canters and all of these things. And the fact that there is uh, a lot of study of the precise cross-connections inside the cells allowed us to see whether the symmetry of the beating reflected the symmetry of the connections, and it does. It does. Yeah. Great. Um, and what, do, what, if anything yet, does this tell us about the cilia in our body, for example? So in, in our body, there are situations in which one has uh, what are called multiciliated cells, which are large cells with many, many cilia very close together, and then separated by a long distance to the next one like that. And so what we have come to understand is that the synchrony that's observed within one of these multiciliated cells is hydrodynamically driven, most likely, uh, as is the connection, the synchrony observed between it and the next one. But when one has, as in, say, fallopian tubes or elsewhere in one's body, uh, these carpets of cilia, there can also be cross connections through the bases. And so it's always a combination of the two that are going on. Mm -hmm. And going back to one of the original questions, which is how, what made life evolve from single cells to multicellular organisms? Has your work with those Wolvicales told you anything about that? Yes. Uh, the important thing to understand about this question of evolution from single to multicellularity is that there are both costs and benefits to being larger. So an organism that is larger made of more cells uh, may, for instance, swim faster. It can escape predators more easily. Uh, but there are metabolic costs to the scaffolding as well as the control systems that the organism has to have in order to steer, in order to build itself. So the question is always, is it worth it? And of course, predation is one important uh, feature, but another is simply nutrient uptake and waste removal. And in that case, we were able to study the Valvocales because they're spherical and it's such a simple geometry, we can actually calculate things like the rate at which nutrients uh, are absorbed or waste products are removed. And there what we see is that as one gets to larger and larger organisms, had they no flagella and no ability to stir the fluid, they would have reached a bottleneck where their metabolic needs would have exceeded what could come in from the surroundings by diffusion. But with the stirring that comes from all of these cilia, they can bypass that bottleneck and be larger than they would otherwise be. So it taught us a lesson that the f fluid mechanical flows play a role in this evolution. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome.